So I'm going to kind of start off at the very beginning. So I joined a training organization right out of college. I have a radio, TV, film degree. And the place I went to at Saginaw, Michigan, Wicks Lumber, uh, I was going to work with two people that had just come from Blue Cross Blue Shield. And Gary Rumler, the late Gary Rumler, was instrumental in that getting them to come work at this company. So uh, they said, they gave me several things on my first day and they said, you know, read these things. And one of them was about guidance, which was called job aids and electronic performance support systems and now performance support. And they said, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to do training. We're going to just do guidance, but we're going to call it job aids because that was a more popular name. And that guidance issue thing had been around since the sixties with Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert, um, two gurus at NSPI, if you will. Um, back in the, those days. And our clients hated the idea. So we we just simply embedded job aids into training and made everybody happy. We made the learners happy because they didn't have to memorize all sorts of stuff that they couldn't and they didn't need to, and they weren't using it frequently enough to keep it in memory. Um, but then I went to Motorola and I went to Motorola because I put Gary Rumler's name on my resume. And so I got hired and and I got a chance to work with him. He's one of the consultants serving Motorola. But and he, and we he and our team created a, a design process, we called it. And on the front of it was this scanning and intake process and all those kinds of things. Um, and we had to validate that there was a worthy need before we would take a project on. So and I, I was there for about two years and then I left and became a consultant, joined a small consulting firm. I was put in charge of the training practice area, which was which I built. Uh, I created all our methodology and I hired staff and I hired subcontractors to do our work for overflow work. And I needed it all to kind of be done more like an engineering organization rather than an artist colony. Because my experience is... <laughs> Everybody does it differently. You know, Addy, oh, yeah, like there's one. No, there's, I'm sorry, there's 37 million, if, if not more. And and so I needed, uh, because I approached things kind of like a manufacturing person. I had learned MRP, MRP2, ERP systems when they came about later on. I understood all that stuff. It's organizing the data. It's building, it's building systems based with products which are made of sub-assemblies, which are made of component parts. And, and so that was my approach to training. And another part of it was my methodology was as a consultant is that I would do project plans and proposals for clients and they'd either accept it or, or not. And always cooked into our projects was a project planning and kickoff phase to review a draft project plan and make changes to it. So the pricing, and I did I did 80% of my projects fixed fee uh, because I know clients like that. And I got burned at Motorola several times and I decided I was never going to do change orders. And I, I haven't done a change order since 82. Uh, wow. I never did order. And because I worked so hard to define up front, what the hell is this project? And do my best estimating. Uh, and if I couldn't estimate it fixed fee, I would ask you if I couldn't do it fixed fee, I would estimate it phase by phase and say, here's the key decision points when we'll revisit my estimates that I've given my client. And, and here's my estimate is based on these assumptions. So if we hit a milestone after analysis and after design, after design in particular, we would know what we were going to build. Before that, it was assumptions going into that. And I've had projects canceled because the analysis data said that the issues that the client was trying to solve were, were caused by things other than knowledge and skill deficits. So they bailed. And sometimes they were going, ah, guy, oh, gee, uh, you know, and I said, well, I just read the data out to you, a project steering team of stakeholders. You shouldn't go forward and do this. It doesn't make any damn sense because the reason we're doing this project is not for new hires. It's to train existing incumbent people because their performance is lacking. But your master performers who can perform above standard, they will tell us that the problems are 
not not uh, knowledge and skill based. There's a lousy process, which, by the way, they don't adhere to because if they did, their performance would suck as well. So they don't they don't follow your procedures and your policies, et cetera. They violate those all the time to get the job done, which is a different issue than training everybody. Um, and so I've had I've had I had a nine hundred thousand dollar project be canceled after the analysis phase because the data informed the business decision, and I would start off doing um, my projects had you know I start off with a project planning and kickoff with a with a kickoff meeting with the project steering team, and I would say here's the other gate review meetings that we will do one after analysis one after design. After development, I do pilot testing and I'll see you after that. I don't want to see you after I develop something and do have you go through the pages, page turning and arbitrary edits. Screw that. I'm not doing that. We can if you insist on it, but it's going to cost you more and slow us down. So don't do it. Let's just go to pilot and test this thing out and put it through the full destructive test. Then I'll meet with you. And then after that, I'll revise it. But at every gate review meeting, I'll give you four options. And I would tell them, the steering team, this, my clients hated it. You have four options at the end of this meeting. Kill this project because it doesn't make any business sense. Defer it because there's something else that needs to happen before we continue. Three, modify the project plan because we've learned something here in the meantime since our last meeting that suggests that we need to change how we go forward. And or approve this and resource the next phase until the next phases. And so that was my, my bias was that uh, I knew all along since day one, since week one in, <laughs> out of college, that training is not the solution for most of the problems that come our way. So in 1985, I was at the NSBI conference and he's, and this whole thing about don't be a change or uh, order taker, don't be an order taker, push back. This has been going on for years. It's probably since I joined the organization, joined the field. And he did not like hearing people suggesting to others that they should push back. And uh, he would, he, so he got up in front of a conference and he, and he said, um, when a client comes and asks you to help them and, and build some training for them, don't say in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? I mean, that's in the whole room erupted uh, uh, this was the keynote speech. And uh, and he said, I always say yes, and I can help you even further if I'll if you let me do a little analysis. And that was always my practice. Uh, there was analysis built in, performance analysis, gap analysis, and then enabling knowledge and skill analysis. But back in the performance and gaps, you could see. What were the gaps? Why do we have people who can perform at a high level to standard and way above and other people who cannot? Do they need training? Is Are the problems caused by training? Now, if it's so I have a saying, if a re training request is for new hires, that's to be expected. If it's to solve a performance problem, that's to be suspected. But nonetheless, I would take the order and then can start my project and get to analysis and let the analysis data inform the client's business decision-making. And I would be challenged them the whole time. Well, it may not be training, but I'm you know, saluting you. We're going to go do this here and we'll get to that point. You'll see the data. I tell this, them this in the kickoff meeting before we did the analysis. You'll see the data. I'll see the data. Then you make the decision. Now, what are we going to do? And I will then, when we look at the data, I will tell you exactly what I'm going to do with it in the design phase so I overhung the marketplace and would tell them what the design, what I would do if they don't stop me. So that way I would be declarative. I'd tell them I'm declarative. And I'm going to do this with your data if you don't stop me. And then they could say, well, we like that, we think, or we don't know, or why would you do that? You know, so I could go into design and pretty much assure myself that my design would be acceptable to them because I'd already told them what I was going to do. I was going to move everything into cell paste that I could. If somebody needed to practice with feedback, then we'd either do coached or we'd do group paced. If the performance involved more than one person doing the work, then we'd probably have to go to group pace because you need more players in the role plays where people are practicing authentic stuff. And I would tell them that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move everything into self-paced. And back 
Back in those days, it was booklets or uh, CBT uh, on their company's intranet, or they were on CD, you know, on the discs, all the different media. So my thing is that I would tell people, take the order and then conduct a, an appropriate project with, the, with adequate analysis here and let the data chips fall where they may to inform the client's business decision-making. I think it's inappropriate to challenge a request when you don't have any data. And so you want to give data. Now, that doesn't mean you can't warn them and say, I would tell clients, and I've done this on podcasts and stuff, I would tell a client, I don't think this is a good idea, but I'm going to salute you and I'm going to go off and do that project. But I don't think it's a good idea. But get out of my way. I hear I'm going to go do it. And they'd say, wait a minute, stop. What do you mean it's not a good idea? Well, you, you're suggesting these things here, and it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like this is a training, something the training can fix, but we'll see. We'll go do the analysis, and then we'll see. And I've had clients where the request came in because they had performance problems that they wanted to address. And I showed them all the data, and the data suggested overwhelmingly, you know, 80, 90% of your problems are not due to a knowledge and skill deficit of anybody. It's other variables. You got lousy data that people are working with. You got work orders that are incomplete. Um, I did a project with General Dynamics where they were building stealth aircraft parts, composite materials. This was back in the early 90s before there was stealth aircraft. And two years of production, they had zero yield. And what, what I found in the analysis <laughs> efforts that we did was that the first thing somebody does is they go get the work order. The second thing they do is they go to the materials locker and pull out all the materials that they need to build up this lay up like a fiberglass thing, this composite part. Then they take it to the kilns or ovens or whatever those things are called. They cook them at time and temperature and cool them down and then do it again, whatever, and make the part. Well, I had an, a manufacturing engineer in the analysis meeting that I was running, and he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you don't go get the work order and then go get the materials locker. You go get the work order and you go over to the file cabinet for the engineering change orders, and you see if that work order has been changed, but it hasn't made it through the system yet. And then after checking in that first set of file cabinets, which is only 50, 60 feet away, you, get, you leave this building and you go to the next building on campus and you go to the second floor way in the far corner and you check those file cabinets to see if the engineering change order had made it over there but hadn't made it in the system yet to crank out your work order. And then if everything is okay, you go get the materials and then start your procedure. And, and I've had clients who've looked at the data and said, okay, to make these fixes, to make these process fixes or deal with these other variables, Guy, that your data has pointed out, and all Guy was doing was asking questions of their handpicked master performers and other subject matter experts and documenting that and then bringing it back to them and showing the executives, you know, this is what your top people are saying. You know, do, maybe they all agreed at breakfast to lie to me, but I doubt it. And, and I've had clients who looked at the data and said, okay, to make the fixes are going to take some time and we don't have time. We've also got new hires to, to, to train. So we want you to continue with the training. And yes, we know that you're going to, that when these other fixes are made, you're going to have to update the training and we're going to have to retrain some of the people on that. But we've, that's what our situation is. And I had not heard initially that there was a concern with new hires. They were so focused on the fact that they got performance problems and that they wanted to address them. It was only when the data came out that they made the decision to continue with the training and make the fixes in parallel, but they would be lagging and then update the training as appropriate. So I have a book uh, that is at my editors right now, and it's called the L&D Pivot Point. And the pivot point to me is, all right, so this is my six phase um, instructional design, excuse me, instructional development, my addy like model. Project planning and kickoff at the gate review meeting there, an upside down stoplight, traffic light that I call a go light. Then we go do the analysis. And at the end of the analysis, we go to the gate review meeting with the project steering team. 
the people who have stakes in this, whether it's good or bad or whatever, they're going to, you know, win or lose based on that. That's the pivot point and the gate review meeting at the end of the analysis phase. Uh, if they can either pivot to away from instruction to some non-instructional interventions, you know, fix the process, fix the data system, give better people, give people appropriate tools, fix the software tools, whatever, whatever those things are, change the consequence system because that's out of whack and that's what's causing the problems or whatever those uh, variables of performance that need to be addressed. Uh, we might go into design. So either they pivot away from instruction to a non-instructional thing, or we do both. We continue with the training or the instruction or the learning because we have new hires that need this and we don't have what we need. And now that we recognize that we've got other problems other than knowledge and skill deficits, but hell, new hires, they have total knowledge and skill deficit. So we need to address that. Uh, it takes too long to, to grow and develop people's competence otherwise. So we, we need to put this in place. So I'm, so I'm of the mind, you take the order and then you conduct a project structured like this. And then you tell the client in the first kickoff meeting, that first traffic light, that they're, you're going to bring back data and they have decisions to make then just like they do right now. Kill the project, it doesn't make any business sense. Uh, defer it until something else happens. Modify the plan going forward or approve this thing and give me all the people and resources that I need in order to do the next phase until we meet again. So that's why I talk about accept uh, be the order taker, take the order, but that's stupid advice if you don't have a solid process that you can trust to uncover the issues and then inform the clients who are in a position to make the decisions. I knew that I they had to pick my sources for the data that I was going to generate. They had to handpick the master performers. If I was going to go do observations, they had to target where was I going to observe and who was I going to observe? Uh, if I was going to look at documents and things like that, who, what were they? I needed the people that were going to see the data that I brought back to trust the data. And I needed them to uh, target my resources for that data. Um, and then it would be believable. I didn't want it to be my data. I wanted it to be their data that I was hired to go collect uh, one way or another. And, and then let the data chips fall where they may. 